Okay, um, when I was uh, approached by Mark to uh, do something, uh, the subject came up that we wanted to maybe give a, uh, a series on Baptist history, just to have a pretty good understanding of where our, uh, what our basis in Scripture, uh, how, we, how we believe, what our basis is in Scripture, and we're going to go over that. Also going to contrast that with what other denominations believe and how they came about and what was going on sort of to understand our origins. The three theories are based upon who is coming up with the theory. The first one, Baptist perpetuity, going back to the apostles, actually back to John the Baptist. Okay. The second one, uh, was the Anabaptist movement, 1525 A.D. Protestants in Zurich, Switzerland believed in be believers' baptism, which is something a part of our uh, Baptist history. Uh, they are, uh, Anabaptists are tied more to uh, the Mennonite and Quaker sect of, uh, of Christianity. And then formal Baptist churches, what we call actual name called Baptist churches started really out of the um, uh, 1612 by John Smith and other English Puritans in, in America well in England and in America Roger Williams founded uh, the first Baptist church in Providence Rhode Island so we have a uh, if you have those that are sort of trying to squelch Baptist history, they'll go to that third theory. Those that sort of tie it to another sect, uh, such as the Reformers do, um, they will tie it to the second theory. The Baptists themselves, and we will see this when we uh, talk about um, the Baptists talking, uh, you know, preachers, they go back to uh, the original origin of the church itself and the belief structure there so it and, and well as we get into this we're going to find out why these the these three theories really come about because of if you look at what the Baptist preachers are saying when you look through legal documents the Roman documents the uh, European documents during the Dark Ages and everything else you'll see that there was a group or a sect that was really persecuted by not only the Catholic Church but the Orthodox Church, and that was the Baptist. Okay, and we have uh, a, so a source of that uh, telling us, uh, and it's called the Trail of Blood, uh, written by J. M. Carroll back in the 1800s, that uh, ties a lot of this stuff together uh, about the persecution. But we'll see those that were trying to sort of eliminate the whole beginning and claim their own origin. For example, the Catholic Church goes back to Peter and claims him as the first pope of Rome um, and goes on from that point on. Well, anything that the church comes up with now is seen going all the way back to Christ versus, well, oh, this Baptist sect was started at way afterwards okay so that you you get that the reformers um, basically were against the Anabaptist movement and we'll go into that <clears throat> for a different reason but they will they will cite it back to and when I talk about reformers I'm talking about Martin Luther I'm talking about John Calvin basically the two main uh, thrusts of the Reformation um, did you say they were against the, ba the Baptist? oh yeah yeah yeah, we'll go, we'll go into that. Great. Okay, that's that's part of the whole history of learning this. Who really believes in believers' baptism and who really believes in infant baptism? And there's a reason why there's a differentiation because baptism means different things in different churches. Uh, why we uh, look at Baptist, Baptist perpetuity theory uh, in, in a strong sense is one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, was a Christian apologist who was from the church in Carthage, 
Africa, which is now Libya. Um, obviously, Carthage at that time was uh, was conquered by Rome, uh, but they were they were rivals uh, at that point in time. But Carthage uh, was also a center when Christianity came about. Started to be very heavily, um, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, Saint Augustine was also came from Carthage. So the, the, it was sort of like a, the church there was very strong at producing um, ministers and, and pastors that were actually very outspoken about what they believed and, and how the church should be. Uh, because all this period, the first four or five hundred years, really are, is a development of how the church was going, what church direction was going to be. Understand that when and a lot of this has a, a lot to do with all the heresies, as uh, the Apostle John talked about Gnosticism, and even Paul talked about the Judaizers creeping into the church basically during the apostolic period, during when the uh, apostles were living. So we already had heresies coming into the church, and that's what many of the letters that uh, these gentlemen wrote were trying to uh, defend against because they, they were leading people astray. Uh, and we see that there's even more of that going on later on and what develops out of that. And part of that is the uh, sacrament of baptism and what it all means. It's very, very important. So uh, your, your item number five there, Baptists also <laughs> trace their roots back to John the Baptist who baptized Christ by immersion. How do we know this? Okay, the Greek word used in the Gospels and elsewhere in the New Testament is baptizo. That's the Greek word for immersion, submerge, usually associated with full cleansing of an object. Okay, so that word means, first of all, we already have a practice, and this is why we date back to John the Baptist, of immersion. There's no debating that. In fact, all the other uh, uh, people that talk about infant baptism and everything else will agree to that. They, they agree to that. But then we have differences that come out later on about what baptism is all about, and, and we'll see why that, that was arrived at. But the word itself means to immerse, and that's where we're picking it up we go right back to that baptism and then from that point on. Now actually, what was the baptism, again, if you look at Jewish uh, tradition and what was God's command to the high priest on the Day of Atonement, they were to be, the, there were pools of water around the temple and these pools of water were used for cleansing. You were to be cleansed before you went into the Holy of Holies, into the mercy seat. And this showed a picture of when you came to God, you were supposed to be clean, cleansed. Baptism is a form, so we see a foreshadowing of what baptism was supposed to represent. Some people take it to be a literal cleansing and it, it, it performs a, an actual act whereas we'll see in a difference in this was actually supposed to portray or at least our belief is it's supposed to portray that baptism represents what actually takes place upon repentance and regeneration uh, by the Holy Spirit coming into our lives okay so that's in other words, it's not the actual water or anything else like that. It's an act to show that that's what's occurred in our lives. Okay, so we identify with that. Um, <clears throat> so we see that uh, we even have a Jewish tradition that was really sort of a foreshadowing of what Christ, Christ did not need to be baptized. John told him, well, I need to be baptized by you, but he did it in obedience to show the way. Okay, this is what's supposed to be done. Okay, and it was really tying it back to what the high, he was our high priest. And the high priest would perform that ceremony for cleansing before he went in 
to the uh, to the mercy seat to see to bas basically be in front of God. Okay, the Spirit of God was right there, and that's why the the blood everything had to be pure, clean, and it just showed that God was did not tolerate sin. Okay, all right. And there was a dis di distance between us and God unless there was a mediator that could, in fact, be the go-between between us and God. So that's, that's what that was all portraying. Um, and I think that's why Jesus went through what he did to show that he was showing the way for us now when, when regeneration was going to occur. Okay, so we're going to go to early church fathers. <clears throat> And why am I doing this? Because I think we need some history here to develop, to understand what was going on in, in the church and how this tied back to the, to the apostles. Um, Clement, probably the first one that would, we would really recognize as an early church father. And he uh, took over the church at Rome after Peter's martyrdom. He was a strong defender of the apostles' preaching. Other church fathers said he was mentioned in name in, name in Philippians 4.3. Uh, if you turn to Philippians 4.3, we will see that Paul <clears throat> writes and says, I plead with I'm not, Eudodia and I plead with Sintetes to agree with each other in the Lord. Okay, and he's talking about a... a <laughs> A problem in the church already between two women. Yes, and I ask you, uh, loyal uh, yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of, of the gospel. And here it's people that have been associated with Paul directly, and yet they're having an argument among each other. And uh, it says, uh, along, the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so we see a mention of Clement and actually... The church historian, which he came along in, our, in the 300s A.D., uh, Eusebius, was, he documented all these things, the church history at that point in time. And he says the Clement that's mentioned here is the Clement who is now, takes over for Peter. Okay, And in the Catholic Church, Peter's the first pope, Clement is considered the second pope. Okay, so just to get some understanding, but what I'm trying to show here is we have uh, a connection right to the apostles. We have Ignatius in Antioch, who was also an apostolic uh, father, uh, meaning he had direct apostolic preaching from 35 AD to 110 AD. We have Polycarp in Smyrna, Smyrna a disciple of John, defender against Gnosticism, 60 AD to 155 AD. Irenaeus of Leon was a disciple of Polycarp and then became the bishop of the church in Leon, France. Okay, so he was like a missionary. He went from Smyrna all the way over across Europe. He was from Turkey over into uh, France and became uh, the bishop there. Uh, bishop meaning also, all that means is like pastor, leader, elder, okay, not, not like the bishop tied to what the Catholic Church's uh, hierarchy is. But, um, and then we have Tertullian. And the reason I did this, if you look at his 150 AD to 225, he is basically a contemporary of some of these uh, individuals who are tied to the apostles. So in other words, I'm trying to show you the ap uh, apostles those that immediately were under the apostles, and now Tertullian is actually a person who's like, okay, I, I've seen these guys in their old age, I've read their writings and that type of thing. So he, he's, he, he's pretty close to that apostolic line, although he's still, he's, he's still further out there. The one thing what we want to see here is because Tertullian is a person who's going to be called the uh, Baptist theologian. He has a whole set of writings 
and we'll probably go into that further, but he talks about adult baptism versus infant baptism. And infant baptism apparently was becoming a problem in the church at that point in time. And he talks about a defense against why that shouldn't be. Why it has to be someone who actually received Christ a child or an infant can't do that because they're not of age yet. They don't even have an understanding of that. And he goes into why, first of all, why baptism is important because I guess even at that point in time there was some thought that baptism, we didn't really have to do it. Um, but it's, it's the fact that he felt it was very important, but it did not reflect what, what we're going to go into as what the Catholic Church adopted, what the Orthodox Church adopted, and so on and so forth. So we're, we'll uh, go into that uh, at that, that point. But I wanted you to see, we're starting off at the very beginning. This is pretty much, baptism is within about 200 years, actually less than that because Christ's death was about 29 AD, 30, you know, whatever, in, in that range. And we have Tertullian, who's basically writing around 200 A.D. So we have, you know, a little less than 200 years between that point in time. And he's already talking about a defense of baptism. Okay, it, it must have been a problem within the church. And he's ta saying he's really taking the Baptist position of adult uh, immersion. So we see that uh, <clears throat> we have this church father early on already talking about uh, a problem when it comes to belief. Um, I'm going to probably not get through all this, but we'll pick it up where we leave off. I, what is the mark? Uh, 15 after we want to? <clears throat> yeah, you, got, you can go a little bit past that. Okay. Okay, we're going to go into the different beliefs of baptism through, uh, I have here, six main groups. There's a lot of other groups, but Six main it gives you a little bit of an idea of the differences. Roman Catholicism at this point in time, baptism removes original sin, and to accomplish this, it is usually given to infants by sprinkling. So in other words, we have baptism not showing a sign of regeneration. We're actually showing baptism has to be had if you want to be taking the original sin. Now what's original sin? Adam and Eve were born as sinners. We're born as sinners, okay? The b belief that because Adam and Eve sinned, we don't come into this world, we already have a chip against us, okay? We don't come into this world clean. And the immaculate birth of Christ shows why, because he could not be of man. He had to be of God, okay? Born, so that's why we have, we have he didn't have original sin. We do, because we're, we're, we're human, and we're not uh, God in the flesh. Okay, so then we have orthodox belief. Baptism initiates God li God's life, usually in infants, by dunking. Now, get the, get the inference here. Okay, orthodox belief, a little bit different, but it starts... Okay, we have to have that baptism so that we, we're on the path, okay? But notice they dunk. They dunk this child. They must put the hand over the, I don't know how they do it, but they dunk, okay? Now why is that? Why are they doing that? Because of immersion. They know baptismal tizzo means immersion. So they're following at least the immersion part of that. But you see what baptism is a little bit different now with the Orthodox belief. Lutheran churches. Baptism, baptism is necessary for salvation in both adults and infants uh, are given, God, given God's grace. Okay, so in other words, it's sort of picking up some of that Orthodox Roman Catholic belief, but they sprinkle, but they can, they can also have adults. Okay, so they, they see that their conversion can happen. It doesn't have to happen as a child or, or everything else. Go ahead, Mark. 
do the, do the Lutherans, I mean, is it their practice to do it at infancy? Yes, it is. Uh, my father came out of the Lutheran Church. My grandmother, I, as a child, I was taken to the Lutheran Church for a while. Um, you know, we, we'd visit and that type of thing. So, yeah, it, it's in, it, it's mostly by infants. Okay, it's very similar to the Catholic Church. I attended a service, the Episcopal Church. We weren't members or anything. We just went there at one time, and they baptized the baby, sprinkled, and the priest, I guess they call So I wanted to present to you the first new Christian of today, or mm -hmm. the world's first newest, the newest Christian. And then, that's where they're. That's where they're coming from. Now, some of them say. You know, like the Roman Catholic, it's, it's a necessa necessary thing. The Lutherans don't go as far. They can go into, you know, we, we'd like to get that uh, that bap infant baptism, but, you know, if you go as an adult, okay, we, we accept that. And why is that? Luther was a Catholic priest who revolted against, but he picked up, he still kept some of the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Old habits die hard. Old habits die hard, yes. Um... So, now we have the Presbyterian Church, and this is, this is the interesting part. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, but is a sign of the new covenant of grace. Okay, I think we're picking up where the Baptists might be coming in on this. But, <clears throat> in Reformed teaching, Calvinism, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, as circumcision was a sign of the old covenant. Both covenants are seen passing on through families. Noah and the flood. Uh, in other words, this is, if you've heard, ever heard the term of a familial salvation, I'm, in the, I'm a Presbyterian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved, everything. But my kids now are being baptized because they're picking up my faith. It's being passed on to them. Okay, this is the difference. Now, let's go to what they use as their basis for this. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 2, and you'll see this is right at the end of Peter's uh, sermon after uh, Pentecost, um, 38 and 39. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, out, uh, the Lord our God will call. Okay, so we're seeing here that Calvinistic, uh, you are called, you are brought in by God. It's not your choice. So it's, if the family made a choice, you're being brought in through the family. Okay, why they, they also go back to Noah. They talk about the flood. It was Noah's righteousness in the sight of God. It had nothing to do with the kids, but the kids were saved. Okay, so there's the difference you're seeing in how they're interpreting that. And when you look at the flood, a baptism by water, <laughs> okay, being saved out of that, you have that whole imagery that they pick up on. Uh, and this is what, what is, some of, there are certain degrees of where they're going with all this, but that's the basis. And I can tell you, I mean, I went to Geneva College, that's exactly what they were teaching. Okay, so this is, this is Reformed Presbyterian, Reformed Christian belief. Okay, uh, they also believe in covenant theology versus dispensationalism. Okay, we believe in God that, uh, okay, we had the Old Testament, we had age of grace we have things that are coming up uh in the um, rapture the thing. they don't believe that they believe basically in covenants the abrahamic covenant it's not that we don't believe in it but they believe it in a different way in other words these things all pass through um to this age and they don't they're what i call um we 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 de deal with pre-mill uh <coughs> Rapture, they don't believe in that. Okay, it's all all millennial. It's all symbolism, that type of thing. So, believe me, another teaching that I 
<laughs> founding college. Why did they call it Reformed? Because they came, John Calvin was also a Catholic priest. He came out of the Catholic Church. They reformed the church. That's basically maybe it was the Reformers. Nice, That's why they call it Reformers. I thought maybe it was a, just a nice name to cover over what it really is. No, 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 no. It, it's really reforming the Catholic Church. Okay, and actually got two branches out of that, the Lutherans, well actually three, the Dutch had a Christian reform, so it was like three branches that came out of that, and you had, they have their catechism and everything, and they talk about, you know, what their belief structure is, and they were against the Anabaptists, okay, they, you know, in fact, all, the Westminster Catechism, the Canons of Dort, all that stuff, <clears throat> you know, they were against the Anabaptists. Anyways, I think we're we're too far along here. We'll we'll finish up with that and get on later on with that. But that sets the stage for where we're headed here. So we're comparing it to other uh, denominations and what we believe. Then we're going to get into the history of what Tolan was talking about. Uh, also talk about the tracking through of uh, the Baptist theology and that type of thing. So.